So connecting from the last uh, video, we developed the framework diagrammatically and we saw that how we can make sense of the dynamics of market price. So uh, here, just to have a glimpse of what we did, now we can talk about it in symbolic terms. Uh, we are trying to summarize these cases in one inequality uh, where all three possibilities are merged that the initial price can be either less than equal to or greater than the equilibrium price so three possibilities are merged and in the first case where there is equality of the initial price and the equilibrium price that is we start our journey from the equilibrium there is no need for adjustments over time but in case of these two possibilities when we don't start from the equilibrium we can uh, have the possibilities of the adjustments over time either we start from above the equilibrium or below the equilibrium so there are three cases out of which these two cases are more interesting and attention worthy because they require adjustments now how these adjustments can take place we are going to model them in an equation definitely these are the adjustments in price over time so if we take a derivative term here it is going to represent the same thing the change in price over time as the time changes what are the changes in the price so this rate of change of price over time is represented with this simple uh, derivative of price or, uh, with respect to time and this can be uh, modeled in an equation to measure that how these adjustments can take place mathematizing the shortage or surplus in static sense uh, we know about shortage and the surplus in the static sense if we just make a small diagram for it this is demand and this is supply this would be the equilibrium price that we are talking about and this is the equilibrium output so there will be shortage and there will be surplus and that will be adjusted accordingly assuming that there is uh, flexibility uh, and there is possibility of adjustment so the price can change and come towards the equilibrium point so recalling this basic concept of the static analysis that we have done before shortage and surplus they are represented in these mathematical equations that is shortage is when the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied and the surplus is when quantity demanded is less than the quantity supplied uh, if I shift the quantity supplied to this side it will become this that is it will appear with a negative sign and on the right hand side we will be left with uh, zero and this is greater than zero it means that there is a positive value in case of shortage this term which is in the parenthesis will be positive and in uh, and this term basically is known as excess demand because QD is appearing before QS and there's a negative sign so QS is being subtracted from QD so this is suitably called as excess demand that how much demand is greater as compared to the quantity supplied and this is uh, the other side of it that is if there is surplus QS will be shifted again and it will become a negative value here since there was a less than sign the answer is less than zero now and it is a negative value so now it is again measuring the excess demand because demand comes first but it is a negative value so we can call it as negative excess demand so we have modeled the shortage and surplus concepts from the static analysis in mathematical equations in terms of excess demand so we will be focusing on this variable instead of any other variable another key point to note here is that greater the shortage or surplus in the market 
more responsiveness will be there in the change in price and vice versa it is just a matter of intensity as you know if the shortage or surplus that is the difference between QD and QS if this difference is large there will be a huge disparity the difference between the two will be there in a high volume which means that the price will react substantially due to this huge disparity for example if the excess demand is very high then definitely the price will increase rapidly uh, and it will be in upward direction and if the negative excess demand is very high that is QS is much greater than QD then in this case the price will fall sharply so you see that the responsiveness the reaction is directly proportional to the disparity or the volume of the difference of QD and QS so this can be expressed in terms of direct proportionality that is the price adjustments are directly proportional to the excess demand something that we observed here in this symbolic expression that is the price adjustments are directly proportional to excess demand we have modeled that into a proportionality after mathematizing it we know that um, constant of proportionality is introduced whenever we remove the sign of proportionality which we have done here so you can see that we have introduced the constant of proportionality which is j in this case and uh, after introducing this now we have an equation instead of a proportionality now we should shed some light on what just uh, this j represents this is actually a positive value we assume that this is a positive value and we have to because we learned here that the relationship between the disparity that is the excess demand and the changes in the prices they are directly proportional the more the disparity the more will be the changes in the equilibrium prices so this uh, should be a positive value and if it is a positive value the relationship will remain positive and the whole theory that we set will not be distorted so keeping this positive the relationship remains direct and uh, or in other words it remains positive and now we have an equation that truly represents the situation now we should call it uh, 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 an adjustment coefficient because uh, it is basically uh, showing the relationship between the price adjustments and the excess demand so it is uh, some way dealing with the adjustments and this is why we can suitably call it as adjustment coefficient so in this uh, labeled equation you can see that every term is made clear this is the intertemporal sense of the price and this is the market clearing sense of the equilibrium price and this is the adjustment coefficient the suitable name of which we just devised in the last step now we call it intertemporal sense of the equilibrium it is because it is including the variable t in it and t is basically time which is also represented with temporal here you can see this word is intertemporal it means that it is between two points in time or more than two points in time inter means between two and temp means time so it means that it is the observation of the equilibrium price between or among multiple or two points in time that how the equilibrium price is changing from one point in time into another point in time and so on so it is showing the equilibrium sense of the price variable 
uh, in dynamic sense or uh, in an inter intertemporal sense. Here the conventional static analysis is represented that QD minus QS is mentioned. So it is that market clearing sense that we are using because you know QD minus QS is basically derived from QD is equal to QS which is the market clearing equation. So QD minus QS is basically another way of writing the same market clearing sense of the equilibrium. So now we have made clear sense of all the terms in this equation. Now let's consider a case where dp over dt they are equal to 0, their ratio. If their ratio is equal to 0 it means that the rate of change of price over time is 0, that the price is not changing over time. It means that there is no adjustment happening over time. And this is that case in which we start from our the equilibrium, uh, the initial price from the equilibrium. As we can see in the diagram that we made before, we are talking about this point. There is no need for adjustment. That is, dp over dt will be equal to 0 when we start from the equilibrium. So that same thing is represented here. In other words, if we look at this uh, situation, uh, we can explain this with the help of this part of the equation in which QD minus QS was there. If both of them are equal, the difference of them will be equal to 0. That is QD minus QS is equal to 0. So if this is happening, it means that we are at equilibrium. And it is the same thing as we see, uh, as we just saw in the diagram that if we start from the equilibrium. So we can explain this with the help of QD minus QS is equal to 0 as well. Because if I put QD minus QS is equal to 0, that is at equilibrium condition, this will become 0, J will remain as it is. And DP over DT will definitely be 0 because J into 0 will be equal to 0. So uh, we have tried to explain the case in which there are no adjustments, in which there is um, equilibrium in the beginning and which is a rare case but we have to consider this. Whereas the other two possibilities are there in which there are adjustments and uh, they can be understood with the help of following uh, simplification. So the adjustment equation is now mentioned here again and we are taking the dynamic sense as we said earlier and uh, for that we can put the value of QD and QS which is already given and we have substituted those values as you can see. Rest of the equation is the same, J remains the same and DP over DT on the left hand side remains the same. Now definitely we can multiply this J with all of uh, this uh, expression and change the signs of this expression because there is a negative sign out there. Uh, so uh, it's that simple algebra that we have been doing. So in the first step we simplified that negative sign and the signs inside the bracket reversed and then uh, we are trying to gather the terms that contain P. This is that term and this is that term so they are now gathered into one sequence. And now we can take P as a common factor out of these as we can see P is taken as a common factor and beta and delta they are kept outside. Um, so now in the next step J is finally multiplied with both of these terms separately. It was there but now it is on in the uh, product of the two terms. This term is containing parameters only and this term is containing the variable term as well. Now we are rearranging it because we already know that it is a kind of situation in which we have 
the derivative of variable p with respect to time and there is a term that contains p. So it is quite adjacent to the first order differential equation and this uh, term should also not be uh, forgotten because this is a constant term because there is uh, no variable in this neither p is there nor t. Now this rearrangement was with a purpose and this rearrangement has given us this form which is now adjacent to the standard form of the first order differential equation. This is adjacent to dy over dt. This is adjacent to the constant a. This is in place of the value of variable y and this is the constant term which was represented with small b in the standard form. So if you remember the standard form of first order differential equation it is very easy to compare it with this form and extract the values. Here we have extracted all the values and you can pause the video and focus on it to make sure if these are correctly extracted. Now if we have this uh, set of values we can solve this first order differential equation uh, for which you know the very first thing that we do is to judge if it is a homogeneous case or a non-homogeneous case. So we should focus on the value of b here. This is that value and if we, if we hair split of this if we will see that j is here in it. There is alpha, there is gamma. Uh, we know about all of these that j is positive, alpha is positive and delta is gamma is positive. These are the things that we have already studied uh, before these steps. So when we solve these uh, three positive values with positive sign and with a multiplication sign, the answer will not be negative or uh, neither it will be zero. Therefore, there will be some positive value of the answer that is b and when it is not equal to zero, it means that we have a non-homogeneous case. So one problem is solved and now the other thing is to be addressed because within non-homogeneous case we have two sub cases and we have to look for the value of a in that so that we could be able to judge if uh, non-homogeneous case 1 exists or non-homogeneous case 2 exists. In this case the value of a is j into beta plus delta. Again j is positive, beta is also so is delta. So when there are positive values being added here and being multiplied the answer will be a positive value and it will not be equal to 0. Therefore we have a non-homogeneous case where a is not equal to 0. So it is that case within the two cases of non-homogeneous case. And the formula of it is this. You should remember this formula. We simply have to substitute the values and for your ease I have put them into boxes or I have underlined them. This uh, y will be repla uh, replaced so it is underlined why not it has a certain value b has a certain value a has a certain value this one and that one as well and a is also there for substitution. So in the next step you can see the substitution taking place it is very easy here you have b here you have a, here you have small a, here you have small a, here you have small b, here you have initial condition of price and here you have the variable p inst uh, and it is um, capital P in this case. y is the mathematical variable and p is the economic variable under consideration. After putting these values we can definitely simplify using the simple algebra and you can see that there is cancellation of j and after this there will be further simplification um, we get this expression after that cancellation of j and now we consider that the exponential expression is very important because you know the exponential decay or exponential growth can determine the dynamic stability of the uh, time path exponential growth. So this is the reason we are trying to make this term compact in which we have j, we have beta plus delta. 
So instead of writing j into beta plus delta, we choose to write only k. So k is a substitution for j uh, into beta plus delta. This makes the expression clearer to read and understand. Moreover, we have also observed that this value is actually the equilibrium price. So we are writing equilibrium price instead of this uh, cluster of parameters that is alpha, gamma, delta and beta. Here again instead of this value we know that it is actually the equilibrium price. So now the expression is more compact and easy to understand it is making sense. This is the time path of the equilibrium uh, price and this is the equilibrium value which is also the particular integral as you remember and this is the complementary function and it is equal to this part in which this is the coefficient and it is being multiplied with this exponential part which will determine the dynamic stability of the expression. So for judging the dynamic stability uh, we will go ahead but right now uh, we have now a definite time path for the market equilibrium in dynamic sense. It is in dynamic sense because we have variable t in it involved. Here as well we can see time variable. It is of market price, yes it is. And it is definite because we have involvement of p naught in this. And there is no arbitrary constant which is usually presented with a. So we don't have a in it. We have initial condition and whenever we have uh, the definitization of the arbitrary constant we have a definite time path. So um, no arbitrary constant we get a definite time path for the market equilibrium in the dynamic sense. Thank you.